From classic whodunits to modern psychological thrillers, each episode offers exclusive insights, behind-the-scenes stories, and discussions on the art of crafting compelling crime narratives. Whether you're a seasoned investigator or a newcomer to the genre, Books to Die For is your ultimate guide to the thrilling world of crime literature. Welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. Michael Hawley is here. That is correct, Al. And his little dogs, too. That's right. It's pretty rough. <laughs> oh, boo. I'm just saying it was there. Yeah, it's a dog day today. We've got it's all <laughs> dogs. You're you're you got dogs going on. I got my old dog here. He's uh, I know 19 years old. I can't believe your dog is your Jack Russell is 19. Yeah, it's crazy. Actually, he's doing well. It's like I mean, if if I was 19, he's pretty good. Actually, he can go out walking. He does everything pretty normal. And I'm thinking, God, when I'm 19, which is what 130 or something, wonder <laughs> I'm going to be in my depends. Undergarments <laughs> ruling out the TV, <laughs> like you're watching old Donahue reruns or something, and no one even knows who I am. So he's doing well. I I don't mm -hmm. know what's going on there. Yeah, that's great. See, I want my I want my dog to be a cadaver dog, so I'm going to ask Kathleen some questions. Yeah, cadaver <laughs> dogs. We're into that. So today we've got a guest, a uh, returning guest, and uh, her latest book came out in March, and it's called Killer Secrets, National Forest Canine, and it's book three, uh, Kathleen Donnelly. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be back. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it would have been, we would have, uh, you would have been back on back in uh the March, April, but I was doing the left coast crime, and that uh, that was just about enough to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it was rough. And so now we're here with you. So, Killer Secrets. How many of these books are you going to write? Like, do you have this kind of planned, or are you just kind of going day to day? You know, uh, I I just announced and signed the contract for books four and five in the series, and I have a lot of story ideas. So I don't have like a set number. It's not like I'm trying to get to a certain number and then be done. I'm just going to keep going with it until it feels like maybe it's it's over. But right now I have a lot of ideas, and I'm excited to get to work on books four and five. So you love your characters then? I do. I really enjoy the characters, yeah. <laughs> So, so does Michael, and he writes murder books, too, so he likes his <laughs> Or serial killer stuff. Yeah, I like so he's in Black remorse, it's a great thing. Yeah, but you say you have lots of ideas, so you just, I don't know, where you just you just have tons of, how do you choose which idea you're going to go with then? You know, that's a great question. I, I just kind of see where the characters take me, where the plot line takes me. Sometimes I'll read an article and I'll think, ooh, that could be a great idea for, for one of the books, because I live in Colorado and I live near the mountains. I'm um, at the base of the foothills and so like 45 minutes I can be up in Rocky Mountain National Park and so we get a lot of the news around here about different crimes and things that happen up in the mountains along with good things too it's not just all danger but uh, I keep track of some of those articles and they'll spark ideas to go off and have new book plots and it's just a lot of fun. What, what point of view do you write these stories from like you're not writing from the dog's point of view you're writing from someone else right? That's correct. So I only write from the human's point of view. I write from my protagonist, who is Maya Thompson. She's a canine handler for the Forest Service Law Enforcement. So I use her point of view. And then oftentimes I do like to try to get into the point of view of the antagonist and maybe one or two other characters if it fits for the story. It kind of varies from book to book. So how do you describe your, your dog in, in the, in the story? Like, how do you, how do you get across what the dog is going through? So I spent 19 years as a canine handler for a private company. And so I feel like I know these dogs pretty well. And I, I chose a Malinois for the book because that's the most likely breed to be used, um, well, any of the shepherds, but I enjoy the Malinois just from knowing them from personal experience. And I enjoy creating a dog that, that's a dual purpose dog, meaning she's going to go out and find narcotics, track criminals, apprehend, find evidence, and help solve the crime. So it's just fun to get into the dog's personality from the handler's point of view, because we get to know our dogs really well. I mean, I, I probably spend more time with my dogs than I do my husband. So I feel like <laughs> yeah. Sorry, hon, but <laughs> I feel like I know them really, really well. 
They're easier to clean up after, too. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We won't go there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just saying, right? You know, it's uh, uh, well, that's it's really interesting. So now on this book here, you've uh, got a cadaver dog, you were saying. So how realistic is that? what we see on TV and, and, you know, on fictional stories and stuff of what and how good the cadaver dogs are at finding bodies. Is it, is it as pretty, is it pretty true, true to form when you watch it? You know, it really is the cadaver dogs or I call them the human remains detection dogs. They're amazing. Um, I mean, any of the dogs that do any of this work are amazing, but the cadaver dogs can find uh, remains. You know, they're using them to find old grave sites, uh, all sorts of scenarios. They can find victims who have drowned, so they'll put the dog in a boat and the dog will hang over the edge of the boat and they can smell where the, the victim is down in the water. Wow, that's amazing. Isn't that amazing? It just it, it blows my mind. So they can alert and kind of create. They'll put buoys out, and then the dive team can go down and usually find find the victim and recover the body. Um, they can find blood and bone and tissue. It's they're just they're very very good at what they do. So I, I don't know about television. I don't know that I've seen a lot of cadaver dogs on television, but I can tell you what I've read in books has been pretty accurate. And if anything, I think they're better than what books or television give them credit. So, Kathleen, if a uh, the, bunch of these cadaver dogs come to me, is that because I'm a little too old? Or what? <laughs> <laughs> they're surprised they see a move. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> they think you're dead, and then they find you. <laughs> <laughs> or they're just dying to see me. I can see that. No, I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sorry, Al, it was there. Yeah, you know. Dogs, their emotional state, they don't hold on to a lot of the um, emotions through what they're doing, right, when they're finding bodies and doing stuff like humans do. No, they'll probably feed off their handler some. Some of the dogs, it depends. Some dogs will be trained to find both a live scent and someone who's deceased. And those dogs can have a hard time if they're only finding deceased uh, victims. So some of those dogs, they'll try to, like 9-11 was a good example. They brought the dogs in, and the dogs were not finding anyone alive, so they had firefighters go and hide just so the dogs could be rewarded. And it, they could tell it was it was wearing on their on their canines. Um, but wow. I don't think the dogs, I think they feed off our emotions a lot as a handler. And, but when it comes to just a pure, like they're only trained to find cadavers, they, to them, it's just their job. They, they just to get to go out and find that scent and then they get rewarded. So it is, they're, they're happy if they get their reward. You know, I saw this um, report came through on the news just just this last week, I think last week it was, in a country in Europe, I'm not sure if it was Belgium or somewhere, where they were giving the dogs MRIs while they were talking to them. Oh, and, wow. and and during the MRIs, they have, they have 13 dogs. Their left brain would respond to words that were commonly used with dogs. So that indicates to them that they were understanding the word, not just the emotion, whereas other ones, they their right brain and it was emotional and that they were talking about that at, that a lot of dogs might actually learn the actual words not just the emotion behind the owner saying the word that there that because it was the le that was that type of side of the brain using it i thought i found that to be really interesting yeah they're pretty amazing. I certainly know the word treat. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And and I believe they my dogs know exactly. They know their commands, they know what I want. I mean it is so I believe that for sure. Yeah, I think I think we're we only know a little bit. I think we're gonna learn more and more as time goes on about how much all animals, not just dogs, yes. understand I think a lot more in certain areas that we don't just didn't realize. And I think that's really cool. I like that. When you're doing the story like this and you're going through your handler, I guess it's easy for you to get into the mindset of the handler, the person that you're writing, because you've been involved so long. So it's not. A, is it a real difficult character to write for you? You know, yes and no. Um, it is easy, like, when she is working the dog and I want her to see. So when the dogs come into odor, when they're finding something they're trained to find, whether it's narcotics or tracking a suspect, their body language changes. Even the way they start sniffing changes. So the way they suck in the air, you can hear a change and you know that your dog is on a scent. And so that kind of stuff I love portraying through the eyes of my character. 
she's different from me in other ways because I made her a military handler and uh, she has PTSD and I, I don't have any of that background. So it's fun because I get to explore some of those um, storylines as well. But then I also get to sit down and write what she's seen working with her dog and just the feeling, we say the feeling down the leash. That's a big thing when you're working a dog is you can just tell when they're on a scent and when they're ready to go find something versus when you're just out walking and they see, say, a rabbit <laughs> that they want to chase. And so I, w- I was going to get into, like, so now you write also from, like you were saying, the um, antagonist, like the, the the person maybe that's not doing so good. How is that for you? How do you get into that mindset? Do you pretend you're Michael for a while or what? <laughs> well, um, yeah, actually, that's exactly what I do now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you did Donna go keepers. Yeah. That's exactly, Yeah. <laughs> No, I um I do a lot of research. So in Killer Secrets, there's a serial killer. And I did a lot of research, listened to some podcasts, especially interviews with the FBI and their behavioral analysis unit, and just try to figure out what makes these guys tick, which I don't know if there really is anything normal <laughs> that makes them tick. But um, I, I just try to see it from their point of view, step into their shoes for a moment and and write through their their point of view. You know, a serial killer or anybody like that, from 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 real experience, I find most of them in their mind, in their world, they're they're not doing anything wrong. So I think trying to express that or trying to understand that will be it's pretty much impossible. But to to show it for other people to to see why they do what they do is probably the best you can do. Yes, I agree. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is, it's a really different, it's something you and I can't understand. Maybe Michael can. Yeah. I, he's, <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, I lack remorse, so it's easy for me. <laughs> yeah, he just does it, you know. <laughs> and, That's right. You know, just keep, keep the dog, God keep the dogs at bay and. Um, and so what do you, what, when you're doing this, is this, is there an intention here? Do you have like some sort of a subtext or is it completely entertainment? You know, it's pretty much entertainment. I think there's sometimes a few themes that come through, but it, it really is entertainment. And I just enjoy writing the story that I want to read. You know, it's sitting down and thinking, I, I think what amazes me as a handler is The dogs go out for us every day and solve mysteries. They may not be mysteries like in my book. In fact, they're not mysteries like in my book. We we worked in schools finding drugs, alcohol, and gunpowder, but we could go into a school and and a principal could say, you know, we think we have something here today, and the dogs could go out and validate that or or find that there maybe isn't anything on campus that day. So that always intrigued me. And so when I sit down to write these books, I just love seeing how can a dog help us solve a mystery you know, how can they be that little extra, give us the little extra information we need. And that's what I enjoy writing about these books. So mostly entertainment. What got you into this? Like what got you into animals, do you think, years ago? Like Lassie? Like what was <laughs> <laughs> No, but you know what I mean. Like we all have yeah. something when we're young and, and you kind of things, I don't know, for some reason you pick up on it and you love dogs, let's say, or some people love cats, some people, you know, it's just different. Where, where, where did it start for you? You know, I think I was really lucky. My my parents, uh, I grew up on a small kind of ranch uh, in Colorado. Very, I, I shouldn't even say ranch because it was just a small property, but we had all sorts of animals. So, I mean, right from the start, we had dogs and cats and horses and rabbits and chickens, and I just loved them all. And I rode horses for a long time. I rode competitively and just loved them. And then when the opportunity came up to work the dogs, I I was excited to give it a shot. Um, They needed someone who could read an animal's body language, which sounds easy, but it's not. But after all the years of working with the horses, you you have to learn to read their body language, or you can get yourself into a lot of trouble pretty quickly with a horse. (laughs) So it, it translated over to the dogs, and I just have really enjoyed it. I mean, it's so much fun. How did that transfer into writing about? You know, I always loved writing. I always loved reading. And I think I really started reading mysteries when I was in high school. I was 
I couldn't find a book in the library I wanted to check out. And the librarian finally handed me a Mary Higgins Clark book and said, well, try this one. And I was hooked on it. And I think it was cool, too, because it was a female author. And it, it gave me this idea that, hey, maybe I could someday write something like this. So I first, I just was hooked on the genre. And then I do have a degree in journalism. And I didn't know what I wanted to do with that. I I did some internships and being in Colorado, I'll, I'll age myself here, but when I was in school, the John Benet Ramsey trial was going on. And so we had to go down and report on it as part of our college uh, curriculum. And I just knew that wasn't what I wanted to do as far as the real life journalism, but I love the writing. And so I just kept reading mysteries. And then I thought, I really want to write one. And so I sat down and started in one day and just kept going. And the rest is history, as they say. Well, how do you put together your characters then in the, these books? Like, where do they come from? Um, are they people you've met through your your years working with dogs and, and life, or uh, are you just really imaginative? You know, I think I, I go with the imaginative. Uh, no one is truly based off of anyone I know. I think my handler in the book, Maya, was created – when we work the dogs, we worry about what we call handler error, meaning that we'll screw up the dog, which we're human, so it's going to happen, and the dog is going to miss something because of us. And I started thinking about it one day. I had a really hard training session. The dogs did great. I did not. <laughs> I thought, man, at least I'm not working a bomb dog. And then it just kind of grew from there, like, oh, if you screwed up your dog and, you know, what what would that be like? And next thing I knew, I had this character who had been a military handler and who blamed herself for the death of her canine in Afghanistan, had come home to heal and was forced to handle another dog again, even though she didn't want to because she didn't trust herself. So that's kind of how she came about, was just a whole bunch of what ifs, but based off of real life, because, you know, handler error happens. We train really, really hard to make sure it doesn't. Um, we have to be, you know, if we get called into court or something like that, we have to show that we're on top of it, but we're still human at the end of the day. So mistakes can happen. I, I, want, I want some names of bad people you've met that you put in your books. <laughs> <laughs> Killed off, done bad things. We can call them up, get them on the line. We can hash it out. <laughs> Come on. Some excitement going on here. That's you know, right. You know, get some real... Real violence going on here. And so <laughs> it, it's it's interesting. So, you know, because this is book three, and you've got a couple more coming now. So your handler, your your main character, how do you get through these things? Because you're saying that um, that handler had different issues than, let's say, what you've been through. There's some things in common, but there's also some things you're, you're, you're trying to get your handler to work out. How do you feel that up, and how do you make sure you're, you're kind of following the right direction there, like doing it right? Oh, gosh, that's a great question. I, I think I just have created I, – I know the character well by now, and I, I can step back and say, what would she do in this situation? Because what would Maya do in this situation? Not what would I do, but what would she do? And kind of looking at – the world through her eyes. So it's almost like you're, I'm a real visual person. So I almost, what I write, I see it like a movie in my head. And so then I'm like, well, if Maya's looking at this scene, what is she going to see? What is she going to do? Especially with her training, her background, uh, the baggage she carries with her as she moves forward and gains confidence in herself again with, with Juniper, the canine she's working. I, I think a lot of it with characters is just looking at it from their point of view, and that's just getting to know your character really well. So, Is it always Juniper? Her dog, you mean? Yeah, throughout the, throughout the books, yes. is it Juniper? Juniper? Yes, okay. yeah, yeah. Juniper is the main character, uh, or the main canine character. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she's the main character, too, really. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and then the, the cadaver dog I introduced, his name is Finn, and he he may be back in some future books as well. So and so the deputy heartthrob Joss. So is that, who who's that after? Is that after Michael? <laughs> <laughs> See, told you I was in my book. Your book there, Catherine. You didn't even know that. That's no. right. You know your picture does kind of look like the guy on the cover. Um, <laughs> See, <laughs> I see a dog on the cover. What are you talking? About? <laughs> oh, that's true. I guess thinking back to the first. Book ah, yeah, I was worried. About that. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, he looks healthier actually. You know? Not as great. <laughs> hey, I, I worked hard at that. Yeah, yeah. That's actually Grecian gray because I want to look older than I really look. Yeah. 
good luck. Uh, <laughs> when you write, this is inter- do you hear your character then? Is is there is is Maya like a real person to you? She is. They all are. Maya and Juniper and Josh and her grandfather, who I call Pops. Uh, they all. I feel like they're out there. You know, my husband and I go up in the mountains, and I feel like we're going to pass them on the road or something like that. Uh, they do. They feel very real, and I think that's a good sign for writers when they start feeling feeling that real. You know, you're really getting somewhere with the book. It's they're going to become real to the reader. Then hope you don't see that serial killer in the woods. <laughs> Yeah, well, exactly. It's, we we've had a few of those here in Colorado, and uh, so yeah, you hope you don't run into them. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Do, do do your characters end up doing things that you don't expect them to do? Sometimes they do. Yeah, sometimes they surprise me. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think of a good example from the book, and I'm not coming up with one right at this moment, of course. But yeah, sometimes they'll do something a little different, and I think, well, okay, if that's what you want to do, um, then we'll do it. But yeah, I mean, again, I know them so well that I don't think they're going to do anything, like, huge that, that's going to completely surprise me. I think sometimes it's more the antagonists that do something that surprise me a little bit more. How, well, how violent do you let it get? Like, um, when you're writing, like, are you conscious of how you do violence? And let's say, because you've got a serial killer in this going on, so the murders and stuff like that, are you, is it, is it a primary focus or is it just there? You know, it's just there. It's kind of in between. I try not to get too violent and too explicit just because I want more people to be able to read and enjoy it. I also, I mean, you know what's going on. You know what's happening. So it's it's kind of a fine balance to find. I took a class with uh, Grant Blackwood, who's a best-selling author with co-authors of Steve Barry and I think he gave some great advice. He's he's a fantastic teacher, by the way. Grant has been an incredible mentor. And he said, if you keep it about PG-13, then a wider audience can enjoy it. And I, I like that. So that's kind of what I'm thinking in the back of my mind when I'm writing it. Yeah, I talk to Grant a lot. He's a nice guy. I like him. He is. He I is. Like him. He's fantastic. He's coming back on next week. Oh, he is. Oh, cool. Yeah. He's a really nice guy. I like having him on the show because he's put so... I don't want. I want to say the word polite, and I don't. I don't know. It's just something else. It just. It just sounds so vanilla when I say that. That's not. He's just very. I don't know. It's hard to describe. But he's not a nice guy. He is. He is, and he's been incredible. Like I said, I took some classes. He lives not too far from me, and taught some classes in our area, and was just awesome. I asked. I just kept asking questions, and he was so patient answering them. So yeah, he's a wonderful guy. Yeah, he's probably rolling his eyes. He probably is. <laughs> yeah, it's good for him. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, why doesn't the dog just get her? No. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the hardest part for you in writing a book like this? I think sometimes uh, it's keeping track of the subplots, making sure I'm not getting too many subplots going. But I do a lot of outlining, so that helps. So I can get rid of some of those before I really dig into the manuscript. I'm trying to think through the whole writing process. I think sometimes with the outlining, I just want to get to writing the book, but I know if I outline it right, it's going to be better. I can up the step. Do you have a beta? Do you have a beta reader like your husband or anything to help you out with that? You know, I have a beta reader, another good friend and mentor, uh, Margaret Mitsushima. She writes the Timber Creek uh, Canine Mystery Series, and she she and I exchange beta reads. So. She's a great beta reader for my books as far as the suspense and the story. And then her husband's a veterinarian, and she knows a lot about the dogs as well. So we catch mistakes, and then I try to beta read and help her with the canine work as much as I can. So she's been fantastic, too. So, like, when you now that you've done Killer Secrets, when you're going on to the next book, book four, do you think you're a different writer? Yeah, I feel like each book I learn something, and I improve a little bit more. And I figure out something, you know, you take all these classes over the years, just especially when you're starting out trying to get a a feel for sort of the just learning everything. I mean, there's a lot to learn when it comes to sitting down and writing a book. And I think some of the books I'm like, oh, I see what that instructor meant way back when. (laughs) And I feel like I'm finally starting to get some things clicking so I feel like I learned something with each book about the writing process. Uh, my editor is great at catching things and and catching bad habits on my part, and I learn a lot from her too. So it, it's been great that way. Or do do you think about the reader 
as you're writing these stories, like when you're sitting down writing, like when you were doing Killer Secrets, when you put down things, like go through each chapter, do you think, oh, what's the reader going to think? Because this isn't the first book. You've had a few books out now, so you're going to have some followers, some regular readers that are going to jump into book three. So are you, are you conscious of that? A little bit. I, I try not to think a lot about the reader because... I, I feel like it interferes a little bit with my writing. I just I just want to sit down and write and write the story I want to read first. I think when I go to edits, I'm thinking about the readers more there. But I'm also thinking about, uh, again, <laughs> poor Grant, he's going to keep rolling his eyes. But one thing he taught us is asking what, what does the reader know and what do the characters know. And those don't always have to match. And sometimes that can help create tension and up the stakes in the plot. As far as the reader, I'm just asking, what should they know by this point? What what do I want them to know? And what do my characters know? And when are things going to be revealed? But I feel like I think about the reader more in the editing process than I do in the initial writing process. Uh, so so where do you see yourself going now that you're, you're it seems like you're doing quite well with these books and, and you're, you're having a good time with it. You really like it. Do you ever think you'll do a different type of book other than a, a dog handler book? Do you'll, you'll veer off? Possibly. I do have some other ideas. Um, I've given my agent a proposal for a different series that doesn't have a dog, but rather a horse. And so that, that would be a lot of fun. And uh, But I love the canine books. I am going to do a new series with Harlequin. It's going to be a, a stronger romance. It's still a romantic suspense, but stronger romance. And it's going to have a FBI crisis canine in it, which is part of their victim services team. So that'll be fun. That's a totally different kind of canine from any of my experience. So it's been fun to learn about. But I, I have a lot of ideas. I love to write. I just... I really enjoy it, so I I'm gonna just keep going with it as long as as long as I can can do. Well, you can have a Fabio type character on the cover, <laughs> <laughs> right? <It's> like, That's right. <laughs> the return of Fabio, right? He's like this uh, crazy guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what do you what do you hope the reader takes away from the book? What is it you want them to after they read it? Um, what's the answer there? What do you hope for? I hope they enjoyed the book. I hope they can. See how canines can help us solve mysteries, not just in fiction, but kind of get a glimpse at what real life might be like. I, But mostly I hope they're entertained and that they, they just wanted to keep the pages turning and that they're waiting for the next one. And so I, I hope they take away just fun. Uh, anyone who doesn't live in Colorado, you know, that they, they get to learn more about our state and the mountains and the mountains kind of as their own character, too. I. I enjoy it. You know, in Killer Secrets, I have avalanches. I set it in January, which is kind of the height of our avalanche season. And it was a lot of fun to show how the mountains could be their own character and bring danger along with beauty. So I, I hope the reader enjoys all of that. Well, I think that's important. I think the setting should be a character, right? I think it should be, people should feel it as if it's a person. You know what I mean? Um, I do. Yeah, it makes all the difference. So now, do you have social media? Do you have a website? Do you have places you want people to find you? I do. So on my website, you have all the book information, and you can also sign up for my author newsletter. I send it out once a month. And if you sign up for the newsletter, you get a free little ebook called Working Tales, the stories behind the canines. So those are my personal little just short stories about my real canines and, and real stories that have happened. And I'm also on, let's see, I'm on Instagram and Facebook most of the time. I'm on Twitter or X, as I guess it's called now, sometimes, <laughs> kind of intermittently. <laughs> yeah. And uh, as a canine handler, it's always hard to say you're on X, so yeah. <laughs> they'll call it Twitter. <laughs> but, um yeah, mostly Facebook and Instagram, and if you just look up author Kathleen Donnelly, you'll find my pages, and there's links on my website to all of those. So, and that's KathleenDonnelly.com. So, listen, who's your who who's your inspiration, or, or do you have inspirations through things other than Blackwood? You know, I'll give him <laughs> crap for that. I'll just say, listen, you know, I'm tired yeah. of you, you know people raving about, about you, God. <laughs> <laughs> driving me nuts you know um no is there is there is there um like inspirations so you like let's say you're having a, a struggle writing or you know you're just not doing it or it's not happening or what you're writing doesn't work for you or if it's whatever what's your inspiration is it like music movies other writers of course 
Michael's books are always an inspiration, but besides See? besides his books. <laughs> yes, Michael's books are great. Um, they, yeah, I think... I love you, Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love um, lots of different authors. I, I have a whole bunch of favorite authors. In fact, it was kind of funny. I had a security question for a bank account. I forgot my password, and it said, who's your favorite author? And I was like, oh. So I was typing in all these different names. I typed in about five, and then I got locked out of my account because I didn't pick the right one, apparently. And uh, <laughs> it, so there's just a lot of different authors I love. I did finally figure out who my favorite author at that time was. <laughs> <Yeah>. But, um, <laughs> I, you know, sometimes it's great to get to the gym and just work out and watch, like, a Netflix show while I'm working out. That's always a great way just to, to – sometimes you just have to get away from the book for a little while or go hiking. I love – doing photography in the mountains and photographing wildlife and scenery. And I find sometimes when you're just really stuck on something, if you just get away, your mind works on it kind of behind the scenes, and then you can come back and, and it's there. So, But I love reading a lot of different authors, and they're, they're all an inspiration. But I would say Mary Higgins Clark was the first one, like I said. The librarian handed it to me. I'd never read a book like that. I was probably in ninth grade, and... Just she was she was an amazing writer, as we all know. Well, there you go. Um, well, we're going to have your website and your book, everything up on our website, so people can find it easily. And uh, everyone, if you've got the inspiration to go and uh, break into Kathleen's account, just remember Blackwood is the password <laughs> <laughs> right now for anything yeah. she's got. All of her passwords, you know, go. <laughs> She's going, oh, shoot, yeah. you got it right. Have at her every every time you want to break into any of her accounts. Like, get on and change pictures. Just, just you know, type there in Blackwood. <laughs> I better change all my passwords. You heard, yeah. you didn't hear it here. Anyway. <laughs> Killer Secrets is the book. It's National Forest K-9, book three, and it's Kathleen Donnelly. So thank you for being here. Sounds good. Thank you guys so much for having me back. Nice speaking with you. Nice speaking with you, too. This has been a production of the House of Mystery Radio Show. To find out more about our show, guests, or hosts, go to our website at houseofmysteryradio.com.